So I want to start this presentation by thanking the organizers, Manuel, Jordi, the whole committee for this conference that I truly look forward to each year. What I'm going to present today is called Who, Where, and When Hierarchies of Night Leisure Social Organization in Mexico City. So the context is, um, this is something that came out of my PhD research, where I'm focusing on what's the relation of night leisure and the effective bonds of, of young adults between 28 and 35 years old in Mexico City. And if some of the things that I say sound a bit odd to you, it might be because here in Mexico, uh, people leave their parents' house at a much older age than the rest of, of the world maybe except Latin America, of course. So what I found is that night leisure becomes the main resource to maintain and nourish significant, significant I'm sorry, social ties. And friendships are at the center of their social lives beyond family and what Rosanil et al. called the couple norm. This means that a lot of these people identify themselves as single people, even if they are in a relationship because they are not, um, very certain that how long it might take. They do not believe in marriage. They are not certain if they want to have kids or not. And the families are very small. They usually are only child. So the friendships are at the very center. And we must know that friendships are not exactly an, an egalitarian, board, um, egalitarian bond, as we like to think. There's great work on these many authors. I highly recommend reading Kinneret Lahat. So, I started noticing patterns on how night leisure gets organized. Beyond any negotiations, I could identify very specific ways things happen that are just normalized as, you know, that's how it is, that's how it works for us, even if it doesn't really work. And what I wanna explore in this presentation is how this concept hierarchies of night leisure's social organization could be useful to understand how those patterns are part of a whole instead of just a string of peculiarities that are described but not properly analyzed. We are well aware of the myriad of inequalities within the night, specifically night leisure. What I was not aware of is the sophisticated ways those inequalities express themselves. The thing is, these inequalities are not understood as a structural problem. For people navigating relationships where night leisure is a resource for nurturing the bonds, it can be interpreted as personal willingness, generosity, or the contrary, being negligent, cheap, a bad friend. And the result is isolation. So it entails very, very high stakes. This organization mimic and reproduce unequal social structures. So the two um, hierarchies that I'm going to focus on this presentation are the hierarchies of nightlife spaces and the hierarchies of friendships. Uh, and the first one is which spaces are prioritized when planning a night encounter among friends, even if it is in a domestic setting. And the second one is a typology of uh, friendship according to their characteristics. This map is important if you are not familiar with Mexico City because this explains a lot of the dynamics that I'm gonna be talking about. So this whole picture is a metropolitan area, Valley of Mexico, which includes Mexico City, the surrounding urban areas and suburban areas. Within the black margins is Mexico City. Within the pink margins are the areas with a high transit towards the central city at night for leisure purposes. And the areas are Temoc, which is a district with the largest night leisure resources. And the other are some of the areas that a lot of people go to from, go to Cuauhtémoc and look at those distances, 39 kilometers, 22 kilometers, 23 and 22. Out of all these areas, only Xochimilco has a very high percentage of people that drive in their own vehicle. And of course, that entails other risks like DUIs and breathalyzer tests. And here I want to focus, uh, well, I also want to point out that a college student in the city, the average of the commuting time is two hours and 15 minutes. 
And when they get their first jobs, they are able to move to more leisure oriented areas of the cities. So the group of friends ends up scattered all over the city. It's not uncommon for friends to live very far from each other. So talking about specifically the hierarchies of nightlife spaces, Cuauhtémoc, which is in the center, this red dot in the middle, is a preference, is uh, even when the gathering is set in a domestic space. And even though we are aware that dispersion supports music scenes and other kind of cultural and creative industries, it is not a part of the itinerary of geographically diverse group of friends. You know, friends are not going to want to go to one of the bars that are located in the periphery. And the burden of commuting falls on those who live in the furthest areas, even if it's more dangerous and expensive for them. You know, and also impromptu gatherings segregates those who had to plan a night out. These conditions the commutes people must, must make to attend, but also lays out unequal risks, ex expenses, and effort a night out might entail for the members of a group of friends. And it's clearly harder for single straight women. One of them says, I mean, it is the same distance from their house to my house, but somehow I always have to go. It makes me very angry, but if I don't do it, they simply won't come to me. And this anger, however, is not expressed because there's an anticipation of failure, but also because this would entail an admission of a disadvantage, that they do not enjoy the place where they live, that they fail to move out of that place, and it reveals deeper differences between the current lives of the friends, and it is met with shame and with a lot of resistance. So these hierarchies transform the whole dynamic between friends. It reveals someone who has the upper hand, even if it's not conscious, and someone who must adhere. And, you know, it's a paradox because the high amount of money that people have to put into commuting, because usually you have to use Uber, for example, and it can be very expensive, that prevents them from saving enough money to move to other areas that are higher on leisure places. The second one um, that I want to try out today, this is, like I said, an exploration are the hierarchies of friendship ties in night leisure. I mean, people in this group of age do not think of their friends as party friends versus real friends as early 20-somethings do. However, I did find enough similarities and differences to be able to build this typology. The leisure-oriented people, you know, their bond realize uh, realize on night leisure activities. The bond is in constant construction. They are still building memories. They are getting to know each other. The, the um, companionship they get from each other is very high. And the ones that are affect oriented, the bond relies on fondness, care, emotional history. This is most of the times a settled bond. So the main characteristics of these leisure-oriented friendships are, to begin with, the everyday life. It's about ordinary leisure. It's not about huge dinners, huge parties. This is about doing stuff together every day. The, spontane the spontaneity, I'm not really sure I'm saying that right, I'm sorry. Um, it requires a lot of independence, independence of uh, you do not need to check with anyone, you do not need to make arrangements about how you're going to move, and the availability of everyone. The lifestyles have two very distinct um, elements. The first one is time. They usually have a similar career paths, usually are involved in creative industries that allow for night late night outs and late mornings, uh, the parental status, most of them do not have children and they do not have care responsibilities. I mention this because usually people who live in the periphery of the city live in multi-generational households with their parents or you know, even their grandparents and they must split taking care of people. 
and of course, I also shared the economic resources. And the proximity, the proximity is not only geographical prox proximity, this entails the same type in venues, similar interests, you know. While affect oriented friendships share memories, their bond is already built, they must attend regular events. What does it mean? Extraordinary but cyclical events. You cannot miss a birthday, you cannot miss weddings, you cannot miss housewarming parties. You have to celebrate the major biographical milestones. And even though the bond might not be so alive at the moment, these kind of bonds are super important to build people's identity, even when they've stopped sharing similarities. And one of the most um, sociologically relevant characteristics is the intermittence, waiting, expressing the desire to catch up, missing, um, as Lahat says, you know, promising, I really miss you. We really have to do this. We have to meet up real soon. Even if you know that that's not going to happen or you refuse to accept it. <laughs> and, you know, it's highly likely that the next time you're going to meet is going to be at each other's birthdays. This kind of intermittence nurtures the bond, the absence, but Acknowledging the absence is a resource of effect-oriented friendships. And the expectations, of course, are very, very different. The expectations to begin with are way higher for women. Why? Because women are expected to remember, to be there for each other, are expected even to organize the leisure nights. You know, when people are finally going to see each other, it's usually one of the female friends of the group that ranges everyone together, that chooses a place, that sends a location. It entails a lot of not just emotional work, but organizational work, logistics. But the frequency, leisure is high, effect is very low. The attendance, low standards, you can miss something nothing really matters and when it's effect oriented you must show up the continuity is really uncertain when it's leisure oriented some of them uh, become very solid friendships for effect oriented the expectations are very high you know they are your lifelong friends and the more bond nurturing as i said is defined in one case by the presence and the other case by the recognition of, abs of absence. So about um, potential uses, um, my idea is that this will allow us, this concept might allow me and might allow, you know, the colleagues to explore how inequalities play in the personal lives and emotional bonds of people. We know night leisure is very unequal. We know women experience more risk, experience more fear, but we have paid less attention to how that plays in their social lives, in their emotional lives. So this is something I really want to address. And I think this concept can help us to explore hidden expression of those inequalities and also the solidarities. You know? Naming them can change these kind of expressions because when people follow this kind of inertia the experience can be very very violent we can also highlight the relevance of night leisure for the emotional lives of people and facilitate comparative studies which might sound a bit up in the air but living in mexico with all the migration that we have the leisure of migrants for example is a very powerful resource to remain in the community, to insert themselves in new com communities. And actually lately, we have a, a very big migration in the other direction. Mexico City it has a lot of you know, nomads from United States that are living in the highest leisure oriented part of the city. And this kind of clash has also been very, very interesting. Thank you very much. I would like to start my presentation by condemning the 
brutal killing of uh, Mahsa Amini, Nikos Shakarami, and many other uh, young souls who in the past 20 year, uh, days uh, have been arrested and killed uh, for uh, the fight for women, life, freedom by the forces of the Islamic uh, Republic of Iran. You do not belong here. I heard an, an old male voice from uh, behind my back. What are you doing here at this time of the night? It's dangerous, he told me. At the same time, seeing a young man walking towards me while staring at me, I started to conspire that these two men uh, are together, and that was a sheer feeling of fear. Seeing the sea of cars with all their headlights on uh, underneath my feet on that aerial bridge which crosses over a six-lane highway, I could hardly hear any noise, uh, but only my, my fast heartbeat and, and the constant um, uh, alarm that was kind of sent um, by the release of stress hormones in my nervous system, which was pushing my limbs to just run for your life. But why I was feeling trapped between the, those two male uh, figures on that empty bridge um, at that time of the night in the first place. Hemad Metro Station, the one that I decided to use that night, is located in Abbasabad lands in central Tehran and is the main access to Tehran's Mosalla, where each Friday religious people pour into this place for the Friday pray. Vanak Square, the place I live, is also located relatively close to Abbasabad lands. However, it doesn't provide any metro station for pedestrians. The closest metro station to Vanak Square is called Hakkani station, which is the one stop uh, after the one I was in at that night. Hakani is the usual metro station I use every time I was going to Tehran for the field work and data gathering during my PhD. Uh, and um, uh, both stations are kind of located in uh, Metro Line 1, uh, which runs through um, parts of the city with sharp contrasting socioeconomic characteristics known, known as the uh, affluent uh, north and the poor south. Coming back from a full day uh, of data gathering in, an old, in the old um, core of Tehran, I suddenly decided to change the rhythm of my usual journey and getting off one stop before the usual stop stop at a Hemmet station at around 10.30 p.m. The issue of getting off in a new place at dark can be related to the lack of street smarts and tacit knowledge as psychologist William James and the philosopher Henry Bergson would call it. Street smarts are in fact cautionary gestures or knowing how to behave instantly in the environment in which one lives, uh, which, which means that the person brain is able to send instinctive and swift response uh, because the person lived there long enough to know the environment and that's why the brain can quickly calculate and learns how to navigate uh, variables and often heavy weather um, which the weather that invites trouble. As a result of a street smarts, this kind of instant behavior gets ingrained into the domain of tacit knowledge as something person knows how to do without self-consciously thinking about what uh, he or she is doing. So the awareness or familiarity of the context is a matter of sensing the physical circumstances within which we are thinking. And this is also related to the embodied knowledge, which is framed conceptually by street smarts. Therefore, living in a built environment for long enough can be helpful to understand the movement of bodies and the temporalities of the space. In a familiar environment, such as Hakoni uh, Station, uh, I have taken in and re-embodied the street smarts in my tacit behavior, and that includes the capacity to understand the details of the environment, uh, as well as clue reading, which means I have more autonomy in reading faces, body gestures, and movements in Hakoni Station. However, in only one stop away, in a socially empty space of that aerial bridge at night, Night, clue reading is not related to the familiarity with the environment anymore, but to a set of embodied consciousness that are developed in the female walker within the socioculturally restricted setting of Iranian city, cities. Here it is important to discuss um, very briefly the sociopolitical context of the country with regard to female body. The sociopolitical context of Tehran and uh, Iranian cities at large is totalitarian. 
Although Pahlavi era from 1925 to 1979 is also perceived as the dictatorship era, the Islamization and the production of Islamic space since the 1979 Islamic revolution enforced a profound sense of set of control mechanism and disciplinary actions over the, the female body in both public and private domain. Moreover, the patriarchal culture also, which is supported by the misogynistic and discriminatory Sharia laws against women, turns the city into a sort of male territory where the female pedestrian and the members of the LGBTQ community are counted as marginalized bodies of workers who are subjected to surveillance, regulation, and order. However, the affective dimension of working for women and other marginalized group is not the same during the day and night. While women uh, can have a freedom uh, to walk alone during the day, the very act of walking alone can be seen as a divine kind of act at night. Uh, at dark and night. Uh, so it is important to consider the moral dimension of women walking alone at night and the problem of, with the male gaze as well. It is the matter of visibility and invisibility for female worker and the abuse of power by the male worker. Depending on the geographical location, the female worker can, to some limited extent, feel invisible during the day, while paradoxically feeling to, to be too visible uh, within the male territory of the city during the night. Coming back from the data collection in the in the old core uh, in the south of Tehran, I changed the mundane rhythm of my research-based journey. Two questions can be asked here: one related to the ethical dimension of the research, and the question of legitimacy of the methodology. Ethically, it can be said, it can be argued that it was a wrong decision, as I had already filled the UK-based university ethical form in which I stated my commitment to get off in a specific uh, stops when using uh, public transport, but it was a legitimate and extremely necessary method to use in order to add the female pedestrian experience as a diagnostic value that can only be found in the ongoing attempt of the researcher to understand the ways in which societies both alienates and oppress women at night and conversely uh, offering them unprecedented um, opportunities for escaping or transcending that alienation or oppression in creative and experimental forms. Being a woman with loose hijab walking alone on that bridge in the middle of nowhere in Tehran, um, in central Tehran at 11 p.m., around 11 p.m., should be discussed within a non-ordinary, or better to say, an extraordinary time and space. The transformation of identity here is also important to consider from an Iranian um, kind of researcher who grew up in that context into a terrified uh, pedestrian aid drift in, in an urban environment that seemed increasingly um, alien, alienating and strange despite its sickening familiarity familiarity. The cognitive and emotional dimension of walking alone as a woman on the, on the, uh, on the bridge at dark um, here is related to the attentiveness of the whole body with all the five senses in an alert position, the, ho the horror of a strangeness in one's own city, the mental confusion regarding processing the male voice from behind and the male gaze from front, the anguish of the moments of hearing cars horning on the road beneath, and the abject, abject, uh, abjectness of the sense of helplessness, which all resulted in creating an intense anxiety. However scary, um, Bowman reminds us how night walking in the darkened streets associates consciously or unconsciously with one's imagination as well. Feeling dislocated from time, I disguised my um, frightful self behind a kind of phenomenological mask and acted as a night walker who is used to walk in the liminal zone between the waking and the sleeping city and between the waking and the sleeping state of mind. Feeling uh, completely exposed to the Islamic opprobrium and the physical danger associated with that, I embraced an outlaw status by connecting to the bottom of my voice to speak with a deep uh, pitch uh, tone and then 
trying to use the impression management, as Goffman would call it, to disguise my frightful uh, self and performing a courageous public persona that is not vulnerable, but that is not a vulnerable outsider, but is familiar and careful uh, about predators. In so doing, I accepted the offer from the old man to give me the, the a ride to Hakonia Station. I sat on the back seat of his car and arrived to Hakonia Station safely in five minutes. Needless to say that during, despite acting uh, the courageous persona, he did manage to invite me to his gentleman pool party out somewhere outside the city of Tehran in that five minutes, which itself um, shows uh, the hostility of cities to the solo uh, female night walker, the phenomenal uh, the night walker. Uh, but I'm going to discuss uh, the phenomena of door door that will um, uh, that is kind of showing how the city of Tehran is less hostile to the uh, female um, uh, body who is driving at night. Although private car use as a way to meet members of the opposite sex is mostly limited to the affluent car driving youth of the Northern District and performance of the Tehran rich kids cruising in their expensive cars, the social phenomenon of Dodor -Dor can be seen as an opportunity to improve urban experience in Tehran, especially for women. Door door or turn turn in Farsi is where separate groups of young men and women drive around pulling up alongside each other in con uh, congested traffic so they can flirt and pass phone numbers through the window. The cars are either uh, either all girl or all boy um, to avoid censorship um, by the Islamic morality police. And if the police show up, they can uh, make a kind of uh, gate, gate away. What is important is the is the change of the rhythm of the city of Tehran at night. Uh, when private cars pour suddenly into a specific parts of the city in northern districts. However, this contradiction um, has recently affected the spatial um, uh, inequality in the city as well. As one rich kid uh, told me in North Tehran in 2018 that we are not going to door door anymore because, because it becomes uh, has um, recently since Point Shahri people uh, also so joining Dordor -Dor and with the cheap cars and socialize with the girls. So he didn't like that anymore. Dordor -Dor, uh, spots uh, can be changed as soon as the police increase surveillance and establish checkpoints uh, at, as, uh, at this kind of uh, well-known um, destinations because uh, as a, as a um, young woman uh, told me, police stop cars when a car passes the checkpoints more than three times um, in the course of um, one door door. Um, so uh, one reason for police surveillance is that um, this phenomenon offers an exciting platform for sociability and creates uncertainty and disorder in relation to the top down Islamic rules and regulations. As um, uh, another woman uh, told me that driving in the car is a better experience than walking in the city, uh, in the streets of the city, because inside the car, I feel that I do have that freedom to do or wear uh, whatever I want. Um, and um, uh, the female, and it's important to pay attention to the female body in Dodor, uh, in the in the phenomenon of Dodor, as uh, as they are uh, kind of um, exhibiting certain ornaments and just body gestures from inside the car, since only their hands, um, and their hands, face, and hair can be seen through the window. It is important for both the driver and passenger to learn certain bodily gestures, either to attract um, a more attention or to get none. Um, making eye contact or avoiding it, holding the steering wheel uh, in so as to exhibit the expensive jewelry or hide them or playing loud music through the latest uh, sound technologies all demonstrates how youngsters in Tehran attempt to negotiate power, uh, power relations to inhibit the uh, appropriate engage with and occupy the vehicle space within which they communicate uh, with uh, and meet basically other uh, other genders. Uh, the effective in engagement of female uh, night riders with the urban environment in different speeds led them to experience uh, many different emotions simultaneously, such as fury um, as a result of changes in blood pressure and heartbeat when chased or stopped by morality police or excitement of being safely 
too visible from within the enclosed space of the private cars. This led women to either feel at ease uh, and converse spontaneously with the male strangers sitting in the car next to them, or display their customary uh, everyday inexpressive blank face, or as Zimmer call it, blaze mask. And all of them uh, are showing the momentum, uh, how momentum basically is the affective uh, dimension of night walking or night driving for women in Tehran and how fear, courage, and excitement can be embodied differently uh, during the walk. Uh, or during a ride at dark uh, in Tehran. Well, thanks for listening. Hello, everyone. I'm really uh, delighted to be here uh, with you. It's my second uh, presentation in uh, the International Conference of Night Studies. I will share with you uh, me and my uh, research partner, uh, Abdullah Zuhairi, our uh, ethnographic work about the urban space, the gardens in uh, the city of Casablanca. So I want uh, to, to thank everyone and especially Manuel for uh, all the amazing work, work that uh, you're doing for uh, uh, to, 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 to push our participating here in uh, this uh, uh, amazing conference. So I want to begin with the history of the green space in Morocco. Uh, the history of the green space in Morocco is linked to a military space reserved for the men of power and the rich of the city. The history garden in the country all has a history. Might be an issue with your mic. Sorry. 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 Yes, Can you hear me? Yes. Can I go on? Yeah, go yes. ahead, go ahead. Okay, so uh, I want to begin with the history of uh, the green space of Morocco. So I say that uh, the history of the green space in Morocco is linked to an elitist space reserved for uh, the men of power and the rich of the city. The historic garden in the country all have royal origin of the longest regional governor. The predominance of the rural character of the country has left little room for labor activities as opposite to, survive, to survival agriculture among the rural, the rural working classes. The Muslim cities of the time did not yet integrate public green space into their urban planning, but rather the private green space of the riads and the home dominated. Hello, man. Hello, everyone. Uh... I'm waiting for my colleague uh, Sana Balbuli to come back. Just saying, uh, do you hear me? Hello? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. So to continue that the, 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 the public garden uh, before in the history of Morocco were reserved to uh, a certain class of men, either power with power or, or, or money. And... Uh, uh, well, with, uh, uh, with with the uh, the the event of protectorate, French protectorate, uh, things started to change with the uh, the French occupation, and the uh, French colonialists uh, started to make uh, new urbanism for the cities, uh, especially Casablanca, Rabat, Marrakech, Fez, starting to to input some uh, public spaces in the in the outside. Uh, one must regard here that uh, uh, 
in, inside this history of Morocco, the public gardens were not something belonging to the city. Rather, we could have some other constructions like mosque, and uh, especially the mosque was the main public space uh, on public utility. So, uh, with the uh, with the starting of the protectorate, we start to have some public spaces in the city. And uh, the main object of that was to uh, enable the, the French uh, uh, populations resident in Morocco to have uh, similar spaces like in uh, the one in France. But with the time, for example, speaking about the city of Casablanca, we start to have some uh, public gardens uh, uh, in the periphery of the main uh, French uh, suburbs. And uh, uh, in the, starting from the 1930, for example, 1940, the French urbanists has started to, uh, to enable also some, uh, some, uh, um, some labor uh, suburb in, uh, in the city of Casablanca or uh, main Moroccan uh, categories, enable them with some other public space also. So uh, in the starting from the 19, uh, Sana, you want to continue? Yes, okay. Can you oh, hear sorry. me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, just I will begin from uh, uh, the green space uh, in the policy of the French protectorate in Casablanca. So uh, public garden became a necessary of uh, urban development to allow expatriate European to continue to follow the same Western uh, way of life in Muslim. Uh, but in the suburb of Casablanca, uh, the policy was to, to, to build a uh, uh, working class uh, neighborhood who respecting the, the, the inward looking of housing logic. So the French, the French urban life uh, therefore had two problems to deal with. Firstly, they had to keep the native away from the European residential area. And secondly, they had to ensure normal and hygienic living condition for the local population. The small public garden were, were created in the traditional intramural city Counter and in the European suburb. We can say here the, the, the Michel Ecochard uh, architecture plan uh, of uh, housing in the suburb of Casablanca. Uh, all the, 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 the housing was uh, inward looking. So they, 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 don't, they doesn't have any space, any green space for uh, the population. So the, the town planner most of whom were French at the time tried at the best they could to make architecture adapted to the Moroccan society and the standard of living of workers or employees. And at the same time, the town planner tried to create modern public spaces while maintaining the mosque, the market, and the Moorish bath in the, in, it, uh, in the same place. It is in this sense that public gardens came to furnish new popular districts in the similar area of Casablanca. We can see here uh, how in the, this working class neighborhood, we have uh, the Moorish bat, and the Moorish bat is re respecting the, the gender, the, uh, separation of, uh, of gender, the, the, this uh, gender, uh, this gendered space. We have uh, the the bed for women and the bed for men, and in the mosque, at the same time, uh, this is a gendered. Uh, there is a gendered space separation between women and men in the mosque. So we have uh, all this uh, building around the neighborhood class. In the same time. The gendering of public space in a city of Casablanca, it's strangely, it's strangely linked to the representation of women in this public space. And a statue of fragility and exclusion strangely linked to the female body. 
the literature on displays of the, 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 the body in the outside world show that women in such cultural contexts still suffer from a secondary role and still operating male domination. So we can say in uh, here uh, two uh, gendered space in Casablanca, uh, the coffee and the garden. Uh, the coffee, we can say that man is standing uh, their back uh, to the inside of the coffee and looking outside. But we can say uh, in the other side, in the garden, when women are here, uh, they are uh, standing their bike to the outside of the garden and they getting on circle inside. So uh, parallel to this spatial situation, there is a temporal situation uh, also, notably that linked to the day and night. Still in the city of Casablanca, the public space functions as a system regulated by gendered norms that prohibit the presence of women in the public outdoor spaces at night. When this presence is functional, it is often linked to states of marginality and deregulation of an established moral order. So when women are present in this, the public space, they have or they must always justify their presence in this space. So uh, they must justify that they don't have any responsibility or they are there for some commercial work or uh, to bring uh, their children from school. So they, they must always uh, justify the, their presence in the, pu the public space. Uh, we can say here that women, when they cross uh, uh, in the day, the garden space, it's just to bring their children from school or they have uh, some uh, commercial issues in the garden. So the city of Casablanca is uh, therefore uh, a witness of this evolution of green space. Like other spaces in the city, green spaces are still strongly marked by a gendered segregation implicit in the use of public gardens. The cohabitation of men and women is only possible through a certain spatial, special and the chronological delimitation of these green spaces. In this garden, in working class neighborhood in Casablanca, men and women share the square meters of uh, greenery and the uh, path according to day and night and according to well-normed proximity. The meeting of male and female bodies can only take place through a symbolic beamer of time and space in the public garden. Whale men can be found uh, at any time in the garden, uh, like a retired people, able people, people uh, pacing through. Women are generally found in the garden at time when they are not supposed to have any responsibility. Uh, at the morning, um, the, the, uh, uh, the morning for women is reserved for cleaning and uh, maintaining the house. The evening is when the husband and child come home and they are supposed to be at home looking after their family. The garden is often located between, as we have said, the mosque in one side and the coffee on the other side. Uh, the illicit place and illicit place in the same time. Two spaces uh, dominated by men and uh, which often rejected the presence of women. However, the presence of both uh, uh, correspond to this division. Uh, so uh, in most, there is a separation of uh, between men and, the, and women uh, to go to pray. But often there is less women than men in, in, in the mosque. In the coffee, uh, uh, women are, uh, are uh, totally rejected from the coffee. 
So uh, in to do to 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 uh, the two space, women are uh, some rejected, and the uh, the occupy the garden who is always between the the mosque and the coffee. So uh, we can say also uh, in this photo at night how uh, men uh, are looking outside to the streets and the women uh, are looking inside to the garden and we have the same coffee here. Uh, we can say the light of the coffee in the, the second photo where are the women, but the coffee is in their back. So the, the men can say uh, the street, but uh, women uh, give their backs to the street and to the coffee in the same time. Here we can see uh, women in the garden and uh, several time and uh, in, at, at night, especially at night. And uh, this is especially for the, the, the some crisis of housing. Uh, so women are standing in the in the garden um, in in summer. Uh, so uh, uh, we can see that the current housing crisis in Casablanca is most visible in the working class neighborhood uh, because of the density of population uh, combined with the reduced living space. So uh, this, this two uh, elements push the inhabitants to find the alternative outdoor space, men invest in space such in coffee, while, while women use public gardens as place to escape. So during the summer evening, the temperature and the suffocation of the small rooms of the house push those women to seek fresh air and less promiscuity in the public garden. The transformation of the garden into an unisex space give legitimacy to their presence outside. This is why they are positioned in a circle pressing against each other, giving their back to the rest of the space that surround them and uh, uh, somehow uh, they, they are privatizing the public space of the garden. The massive occupation of women produce an exclusion to the men whose presence in the garden at that time, uh, at the time of, of the occupation by women at night, becomes socially and morally rejected in the same way that the presence of women in public space like a coffee is socially and morally rejected. It's like stepping the private space of women. So the appropriation of a green space by, by women take place in a kind of implicit contact with men who occupy adjacent space such as cafe or the mosque and leave all or large parts of this public garden to women. The strategies of closing and the bordering the garden are uh, carried out in a kind of collective proximity where women are united to the limited zone of freedom in the middle of the urban night. So we can see how uh, women occupy space and uh, uh, change the use of the garden uh, with uh, some um, uh, amusement or a commercial purpose for women or for their child. So we can so uh, also how women change the use of garden with the female aesthetic purpose. So once this sitting in front age operated, uh, the women transformed their garden into feminized space. Uh, where their bodies are not anymore under the control and the, the glance of the men. In addition to the women uh, decorated posture and the proximics 
We find feminine service activities, such manicure and henna tattooing in a mixed space. This act of tattooing is hardly free from const constraint on the women's bodies. Where is it their hair or their feet being tattooed? Paradoxically, it is sometimes men who provide service such as selling or animating games for children accompanying those women. But these men have a specially statute, uh, it's a statute of hosts and guests who must necessarily comply with the female norms of this space. It should be noted that although the presence of women in the garden can begin uh, around middle afternoon with the, uh, when they pick up their children from school, but the privatization and the feminization of the space does not begin until the night. Uh, why? Because the darkness allow women to liberate their practice and their bodies through uh, practice intended to maintain their body. So uh, to conclude my presentation, I would like to emphasize how night studies allow us to better understand the complexity of gender relation and the complexity of the use of public and the uh, private space in North Africa society as it's the case in Casablanca because they allow us to reveal the relationship of domination and power that do not always go in one direction because women sometimes find why to, to create parallel space as uh, Fatima Mernisi always said in uh, this work about the harem. I want to thank you. I, I want to apologize for uh, the technical uh, uh, travel. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so my name is Hallie. I'm a PhD candidate uh, at Rutgers University in the US. Um, so my title is different than the program because I never can make up my mind about these things. Um, but the same topic, of course. Um, so my title is Lefebvre Nighttime and the Temporality of Gender. Um, so as one of the most kind of iconic gender-based protests, take back the night as it is called in the US or reclaim the night as it is called in the UK and internationally is a yearly demonstration calling attention to the disproportionate violence, gender and racially, racially marginalized bodies endure each day. While both iterations make larger demands to end rape and violence more broadly, each started decades ago to draw attention to the ways gendered subjects are at higher risk to their safety during nocturnal hours. As both names suggest, the concerns over nighttime safety remain a central backdrop in working to end gender-based violence at large. As this panel has detailed thus far, experiences of nighttime um, are not equal, but rather are conditioned by one's sociopolitical location. Access to nocturnal freedom, safe nocturnal freedom, is not equally attainable. The continued gender and racial-based violence during nighttime hours detail the inequitable ways nighttime is socio-mediated and concretely lived across intersecting systems of oppression. Though uh, there is a particular gendered figure that has an even more fraught relationship with the night, the girl. Marginalized by both intersectional experience of gender, race, class, ability, location, as well as age, further nuances thinking around inequitable nighttime experiences. As she is not yet afforded the certain freedoms of adulthood, the girl figure has little to no access to safe experiences of nocturnal publics. Take Back the Night or Reclaim the Night importantly highlights how safe public experiences of nighttime for gendered bodies is not given, and I would argue is even less so for the girl figure. So much of what I will say today are initial theoretical ideas coming from my dissertation titled Girlhood After Dark, Nighttime Leisure, and the Temporality of Gender. So pairing Marxist foundational theories of clock time with Marxist feminist theories of social reproduction, my dissertation shows how the figure of the girl illuminates the temporal regulation of gender under capitalism. This theory building project takes shape uh, through a cultural analysis of representations of girls as nighttime leisure, similar to Yolanda, um, as one of the most devalued activities at one of the most unproductive times of the day. I argue girls nighttime leisure is a fruitful time space for both theorizing and resisting patriarchal racial capitalism. 
for today. I'm only focusing in on the girls subject access to nighttime leisure outside the home specifically, um, which is key because my dissertation I do domestic and different spaces as well. So as the home is the most culturally appropriate nighttime space for the girl to be, the girl out at night has repeatedly been cause of concern, cultural and social concern in the United States, particularly where I'm housed. Um, in this paper, I want to discuss a byproduct of this concern, which is a common cultural phrase, a girl shouldn't be out after dark. This phrase suggests that the idealized girl figure cannot be out at night and retain the presumed innocence afforded to her. Indeed, proximity to nighttime darkness heightens the gendered, racialized, and class boundaries between innocence and deviance, protection, and risk. The girl out at night is what I argue a cultural impossibility. The later she roams through the dark hours, the further she drifts from the protections of girlhood. I argue this occurs through a dual temporal nature of girlhood. The idealized girl figure is conditioned, I argue, by two versions of capitalist time that are unique to her positionality, future time and clock time. Firstly, as an eventual adult laborer, the girl figure's value to capital largely relies on her development into a, quote, good capitalist subject, a subject whose development is mapped onto capitalist logics of productivity through temporal conditioning. As a becoming subject, there has and continues to be much investment in girls and childhood more broadly. The common phrase, children are the future, uh, importantly situates that children have much to make good on as they have the capacity to still grow and develop into future productive and capable adults. While much of the work on the girl figure has been about her future life and detail the neoliberal self-improvement tracks it takes, there has been less attention to the temporal conditions through which this occurs in girls' everyday life. I argue that the second temporal relation, clock time, serves another important function in the reproduction of the capitalist girl subject through temporal control. One that can importantly highlight the role nighttime plays in experiences of girlhood under our current capitalist order. While much work on gender and nighttime has focused on its spatial characterization, in my research, I highlight the temporal dimensions of both girlhood and nighttime as central to encapsulating what I call the temporality of gender, or the way capitalist time conditions experiences and performances of gender across both future and diurnal timing of life. I argue that focusing in on one nocturnal act can illuminate this relation uh, most acutely, which is girls' nighttime leisure. As many night study scholars have researched and theorized, nighttime has a different tempo in comparison to the day. Nighttime has been historically understood as a time of rest, freedom, and sociality, but as it exists in contrast with the productive hours of the capitalist day, it is also associated with unproductivity and by effect deviance. As this conference has detailed through many different angles, the boundaries of nocturnal freedom constrict and expand with the social valuation and devaluation of people's time. As a helpful term to capture this particular experience of time, nighttime leisure provides an angle through which we can see temporal negotiations and the way capitalist power dictates nocturnal experiences of life and culture. When considering the everyday clock time experiences of girlhood particularly, girls largely only have access to leisure or free time at night, making it an important temporal point to study in how the dual functioning of capitalist temporality across both future and clock time becomes serviceable to the production of capitalist girlhoods. As I began this talk, there is much at risk for the girl figure during the night hours, institutionalizing strict boundaries over her access to both the space and time for nighttime leisure activities. The perceived threat of what nighttime could bring positions the domestic home and the girl's bedroom most specifically as the most appropriate place for the girl to be during the night. As it safeguards against threats that could disrupt her future developmental development into a capitalist subject, it in turn relegates nighttime leisure outside the home an impossibility if she is to uphold the expectations of gender developmental success. As such, the girls' nighttime engagements are conditioned by the dialectical temporal relation of both clock time and future time. 
As such, when girls do engage in nighttime leisure outside the home, they present an example of what I call a nocturnal moment or a moment in time that escapes the linear trajectory of time that capital dictates across both, both the everyday and the future. The true subversive potential of girls' nighttime leisure requires adopting a more complex and dialectical understanding of time, one that moves beyond the linear. The formulation of this idea emerges from a generative reading of Henry Lee Febvre's concept of rhythm analysis, which I turn to next. Henry Lefebvre's theory and method, theory and method of rhythm analysis um, is indispensable to understanding kind of this dialectical nature of time and how it plays into everyday life. In rhythm analysis, space, time, and everyday life, Lefebvre's idea and use of rhythm as a theory and mode of analysis makes visible the dialectical nature of two versions of time central to Lefebvre's work. It's linear time and cyclical time. He defines both as follows, quote, the, the cyclical originates in the cosmic, in nature, days, nights, seasons, the waves and tides of the sea, monthly cycles, etc. The linear derives from social practice, from human activity, the monotony of actions and of repetitions imposed structures. Now, while each is temporal quality separate them from one another, their dialectical or codependent relationship at the same time entwines them together. Each type of time imposes on the other a unit of time measurement that combines to create the generalized social measurement of time we know today. Thus, the relationship between linear and cyclical time is not simple, but active and animated through the complex, what Lefebvre writes, interactions, interferences, the domination of one over the other, or the rebellion of one against the other, end quote. Uh, these interactions combine to give shape to the epistemological center of Lefebvre's ideas in this body of work, rhythm. While Lefebvre is largely known for his body of scholarship on space and urbanism, the production of space and the right to the city, you know, most notably, and many works of nighttime focus on these, uh, Rob, for those who know, Robert Williams' Noteworthy Article in Nighttime Spaces being an important facet of this, I argue that rhythm analysis is generative for thinking about the role time specifically plays in theorizing the night as central to the functioning of and the challenge to capitalist dictates of time and its ability to regulate gender performance. Rhythm analysis studies these varied creations and interactions between distinct but dialectical rhythms. Paralleling Marx's focus on the dialectical relation between production and reproduction, concrete labor and abstract labor, Lefebvre's conceptualization of rhythm analysis finds that temporal rhythms exist in a similar interconnected way. Thus, it's a historical materialist method of inquiry that investigates the social relations producing a particularized experience of time and rhythm. In both the quantitative aspects of time, which mark time and distinguish moments from each other, and the qualitative aspects of time that link them together. Social time is therefore formed through the complex interaction of everyday rhythms and life across both linear and cyclical tempos. Recognizing time as a dialectical process through rhythm analysis in turn allows one to also see the gaps in the temporal order for struggle and resistance. The dialectical process of time as rhythm stipulates that any oppressive version of linear time, like the abstracted hegemonic clock time of capitalism, is never absolute as it must rely on the concrete cyclical nature of time to give it shape. This dialectical nature by effect necessitates a look to other rhythms that are suppressed in the more normative dominant mode of, the, of time capitalism creates and operates through to see moments and opportunities of resistance. And this is where nighttime comes in. <laughs> you know, Lefebvre has a few noteworthy thoughts on nighttime throughout his work on rhythm analysis and, and the, um, in his other work as well. Um, but for example, on the topic of night's impact on clock time or the linear regulation of the everyday, he writes that the night does not interrupt the diurnal rhythms, but modifies them and above all slows them down. So I take up Lefebvre's argument about nighttime cyclical modification of linear time and further insist that the night hours are an important element in understanding everyday life and rhythm. 
Robert Shaw's The Nocturnal City details this when talking about the night as frontier, but indeed the power of nighttime and its direct role in the cyclical rhythms that disrupt the incessant monotony of, lin of linear and time cannot be overlooked in studying the social socially mediated ways nighttime is both controlled and lived, um, particularly for subjects who have limited to no access to nocturnal freedom in the current hegemonic order. To further this, I wanna connect nighttime to one of the most important interventions of rhythm analysis, in my opinion, um, which is Lefebvre's idea of appropriated time. Here at length, you know, cause it's super great, um, is he writes that whether normal or exceptional, appropriated time is a time that forgets time, during which time no longer counts and is no longer counted. It arrives or emerges when an activity brings plenitude, whether this activity be banal, subtle, spontaneous, or sophisticated. This activity is in harmony with itself and with the world. It is in time, it is a time, but it does not reflect on it. Appropriated time in its simple or extravagant forms is the process by which a subject takes time into their own hands in relation to the dialectical antagonistic unity of linear and cyclical time, I read nighttime as a moment full of potentiality in which the appropriation of time can occur. Nighttime is the shadow counterpart to the daylight of capitalist control or the arbiter of linear time. The reason nighttime is home to a plethora of deviant acts, why adults fear its impact on girls specifically, is in its basic construction as untethered, undefined, and unregulated by the daylight of capitalist labor time, of course, if you're not a night shift worker. But, capital, but nighttime is also a totalizing nonlinear experience. Its darkness is ever enveloping. There is no punctuating darkness, and you cannot measure nighttime visually the same way that you can do with daylight. Once it falls, it's final until the next day starts with the sun. Thus, the open, undefined, and totalizing nature of nighttime makes room for opportunities of appropriated time. I call examples of the interrelationship between nighttime and appropriated time nocturnal moments. Nocturnal moments are interstitial gaps in time that challenge the seamless flow of the linear time of capitalist production and social reproduction. These moments, I argue, are distinct because of the nature in which they're lived out in darkness. So Lefebvre also has a theory of moments in his large work on critique of everyday life. Um, Eldon summarizes um, moments for Lefebvre as significant times when existing orthodoxies are open to challenge, when things have the potential to be overturned or radically altered, moments of crisis in the original sense of the term. Considering this, it is clear to see how nighttime houses opportunities for temporal moments of crisis in opposition to the rationality of daylight. Given the nature of nocturnal moments as rooted in the dialectical rhythm of linear and cyclical time, nocturnal moments are not place specific, but are rather specified through their temporal rhythmic quality. Thus, night, the night rhythms experiences of moments regardless of where nighttime is spatially lived. When considering the dual temporal nature of the girl's subject, I argue girls' nighttime leisure outside the home provides a key nocturnal moment that rhythms the linear narrative of girlhood and the temporality of gender at large. While social and cultural norms of gender, race, class, ability, and age have and continue to render girls' nighttime cultural engagements as off limits, dangerous, and risky for their safety, as well as their productive futures, Girls nevertheless appropriate the dark of night to meet their own needs. As I continue to develop these ideas in my dissertation, I remain animated by these nocturnal moments and what they tell us about the role nighttime and time itself play in conceptualizing freedom and resistance in life after dark. Thank you. <laughs> I bring uh, some preliminary presentation about queer nights at Lisbon that is based in, in social historical in the social historical pers perspective of night, uh, also as a space time for gender liberation as a stage uh, that allow uh, specific uh, people um, with identities that, that are more marginalized to bound and to explore their identities and also sociabilities. 
uh, this presentation, uh, this, this presentation, as I told you before, uh, it doesn't really have the funding. It's more like a curiosity uh, of me, Jordi, Manuel, and also other people with whom I work. And uh, because of this, is, is a kind of preliminary exercise to bring or to make visible, you know, the, the relevance of queer cultures to, um, to the history of uh, nightlife in Lisbon. And uh, yes, before I go, uh, I would like to bring two disclaimers. Uh, the first, first one is to say that uh, in this presentation, I'm using queer. Uh, to define people that are sexually, um, that are di um, diverse in terms of their uh, gender identity and also expression and also sexuality. And yes, uh, traditionally it was a derogatory uh, slur, uh, but in the last years it's a concept that is, you know, being intentionally used by several communities to uh, name the experience of uh, not passing as a cisgender or heter heterosexual uh, person. Uh, so in this text or uh, in this uh, presentation more specifically, uh, I'm using this umbrella term uh, to define, you know, uh, the diversity of people with non-heterosexual, uh, that are non-heterosexual and non-cisgendered. Non and the second disclaimer is that is in this presentation, I, I have um, at least one quote that is uh, very problematic and has, you know, some homophobic and transphobic content. And uh, of course, uh, by analyzing historical sources, um, several times we, you know, we check and we read and we use, you know, very problematic quotes that express it, uh, the mentality of those times. And our intention by bringing or to making these quotes visible again is not because uh, it's, it's basically uh, to denounce uh, the historical continuity of uh, specific uh, beliefs and discriminations uh, and also microaggressions and ways uh, and opinions regarding, you know, uh, uh, gender and sexual diversity. So of course, uh, it's time to say uh, that we that we are profoundly uh, critic towards that assumptions. So this is a socio-historical, a very preliminary, as I told you, uh, something that is a kind of embryo and we are still searching for other sources. On the other day, I was uh, talking also with Manuel about other sources uh, he found uh, regarding Fado and the relevance of Fado for queer subculture. So uh, it's still a work in progress. It's not a final output or a final reflection. It's more, you know, like a beginning of something. Um, and yeah, we are using to do this uh, historical sources, uh, scientific, you know, like, um, uh, you know, uh, papers are in specific a PhD dissertation uh, from the 20s of the 20th century, also media, literature, and illustration of this specific period of time. Uh, then also some literature review more around the 80s. And finally, data from a web survey implemented in the scope of a European project, uh, Sexism Free Night, that was a project uh, analyzing analyzing the, um, the experiences uh, of sexualized violence uh, around uh, people people that go out at night, but also you know the experiences uh, of having fun at night, like what places are the people going going on, and uh, what drugs are they using. So exploring you know the behaviors um, doing it. Uh, we did a gender analysis. Uh, analyzing, you know, the, the um, differences and specificities in going out among women, uh, cis, cisgender women, uh, cis women, of course, cis men, and also uh, queer people. 
So uh, just, uh, you know, um, to begin it, uh, it's important to say that uh, queer nightlife, it's strange that word, night stare, but it's an error. Queer nightlife is uh, not new because, uh, for example, in some uh, historical sources regarding very old cults, like, for example, Bacchanalia, it was this reference to these, you know, um, uh, orgies, um, and the use of drugs in nightlife environments and this kind of queer sex between women who have sex with women, with men, and you know this kind of um, freedom in sexual expression. Uh, and also we had some references uh, to queer nights or to uh, you know queer uh, nightlife sociabilities uh, in the ancient Greece uh, and also ancient Rome mainly among uh, you know gay uh, gay men or on that on that time they you know the, the the term gay men was not used but you know men who had sex with other men uh, and usually these were related with hedonistic and uh, experiences um, uh, exclusive to men and some of them in you know party environments so just a note to say that uh, the way uh, our society sees, um, uh, you know, or, 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 or saw uh, gender and sexual diversity in the last century was very much influenced uh, by, you know, social constructions, Western-based social constructions, uh, sustained also by patriarchal norms and uh, hygien uh, hygienist institutions that considered uh, homosexual, uh, um, you know, uh, homosexual, that defined homosexualism as some kind of sexual deviance, but we all know this. And this kind of patholog pat uh, pathologization of non-heterosexual uh, people uh, tra tra trapped uh, these people for several time in the dichotomy, in um, a very problematic dichotomy between the moral and the health. For one hand, they these kind of sexualities were considered like a vice or something immoral, deviant. Uh, but on the other hand, also you know, on the the other hand, also the idea of. Uh, you know, like victimization and seeing it as a sickness and that these people were, were, were sick and something was not uh, well with them. Uh, so this was something that, of course, influenced the way of, of thinking and, um, and reacting, let's say, uh, to gender and sexual uh, diversity during several decades in, in the last century. And of course, these also appear when we read uh, or, or when we, we were reading about, uh, you know, nightclubs in the 20s of the 20th century. That was, uh, you know, a very vibrant uh, period in, in Lisbon regarding nightlife and the new sonorities in the city, dance clubs, drugs around. Uh, and when analyzing, uh, you know, um, the the impact or the, the the characteristics of nightclubs that were very much related with cocaine use because there was this uh, idea that nightclubs uh, were you know spreading the very bad habit of using cocaine and these were mainly related with women you know that that were using cocaine and and influencing other uh, young men and also this idea that were these queer people that were around nightclubs and at this time uh you know for one hand uh cocaine use was used to you know de degrade even more these people these queer people but at the same time uh, you know uh, being queer was also used to degrade cocaine use so it was this kind of double alterity very problematic and that actually, uh, we also find these days uh, um, uh, currently when we talk about, for example, uh, new psychoactive drugs or GHB or methamphetamine sometimes, also these um, very problematic ideas um, about drugs or you know the diabolization of specific drugs 
is quite related with the people who are using it, you know, and um, 100 years ago, we also had this kind of uh, mentality. Then, of course, we had the Hidden Queer Nights. Uh, after the, the vibrant 20s, uh, we had our detectorship uh, that was known for, pers uh, pers um, for, you know, for repressing a lot, um, several specific groups of the society, like, for example, uh, sex workers, but also queer people, um, uh, among, uh, among others. And on this time, some literature uh, says that, uh, you know, uh, gay, uh, men who have sex with men were meeting each other in private settings, more in, you know, houses of someone, urinals, uh, parks in the city. So public spaces that were more dark, hidden, you know, more, um, um, yeah, more, more clandestine, let's say. Uh, then we had an interesting moment in our history uh, after the end of our detectorship in Portugal. Uh, we had a kind of queer renaissance uh, in the city of Lisbon. It was a very interesting moment. And actually some of the more, uh, let's say, interest, uh, relevant clubs for the queer cultures uh, today were you know, created on, on those times, like for example, Trump's. And, um, and yeah, during this time, it, there was a lot of experimentation regarding, you know, uh, gender expression and new sonorities in the city, uh, also new sociabilities uh, at night, uh, the creation of new intimacies also. And, you know, some of, some of it also mediated by the use of drugs. So this was an interesting moment in our, and in our history, as you can see in these pictures. But it was suddenly interrupted by the, um, ah, before that, uh, some papers talking about that specifically period highlighted the role uh, of getting high to, you know, to have more, to express more freely, you know, uh, one's sexuality and also one's identity. And that these kind of environments, uh, these nightlife environments, were constructing with the daily, you know, with the, um, um, you know, with, with the gender oppression and also discrimination and uh, you know, very um, problematic reaction that uh, the society had towards uh, diversity. In the daytime, in the in the um, in the in the day, in the hours of the day, uh, so somehow nightlife offered a stage for these people to um, perform gender and to experiment, and uh, yeah, drugs, uh, music, and you know other technologies play the role in this. So after this very vibrant, uh, you know, renaissance of queer nightlife and even queer cultures, uh, there was this very problematic moment with HIV and the new, you know, pathology uh, phase of uh, pathologizing these 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 people, sexualities and the intimacies that was related with the infection of HIV. Uh, as a kind of symbol, uh, Antonio Variações, that was a queer uh, pop, pop, pop artist, um, on that time died in 1984. And after this, several people, um, you know, died also infected with HIV. And this was a very dark uh, moment for, for these communities. And it, it is still a kind of phantom or a kind of ghost um, around the, uh, these communities until these days, uh, but had a huge impact in this you know, flourishing of uh, queer nightlife. And here, uh, just to present some data from uh, the Sex and Free Night from, from my project, I will not enter in, 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 in details. Uh, because I don't have time and it's not the moment, but I would like to tell you um, that uh, there is something that sometimes is problematic. And for me, that, that, that I'm a person working in mainly in the drugs field, sometimes when we talk about LGBTQ or queer people, it seems that there's that is something very homogeneous. 
uh, and it, it is not. Um, and it is not uh, also in terms of access to nightlife uh, and experiencing nightlife. And this is very important to say. Uh, and um, in our research, when we disaggregate our data by gender and by sexual orientation, we found important differences regarding, uh, you know, the frequency or um, uh, the number of times uh, that people visited party spaces. And we found that, um, um, you know, it is more, um, um, how can I say, that actually uh, when we analyze with cisgender people like uh, Block, um, all the yeah, diversity aggregated, we found that these people tend to, to go out more times uh, than, for example, cisgender uh, women. Um, however, there are important uh, um, differences that, that I would like to, to highlight. Like for example, the fact that uh, you know um, lesbian um, uh, lesbian people prefer to to be at private settings compared to to gay men, and this may be related with the fact that actually in our cities we have a gay cir circuit very well established, and we don't really have the same for uh, other gender identities. And probably because of this, uh, at least in Lisbon, we have uh, some collectives creating other spaces to, for their you know, uh, parties and sociabilities. Uh, I will you know, go uh, and say, of course, there are, uh, when we talk, if you search about you know, LGBTQ night or queer night or something in, in the Google, you will see that uh, most of the references you have it's related with gay uh, with gay nights, but you know gay venues are very um, exclusionary and uh, you know they are dom dominated by men uh, cisgender men, uh, and of course they exclude um, and uh, and have more privilege uh, than other uh, people like for example trans woman. Uh, and uh, and other folks. And because of this, there is something very interesting happening in Lisbon, but I think it's also happening in other cities. Uh, that is the, um, you know, the creation of new spaces and uh, the new, um, yeah, the, the new spaces for people that are not identifying with, uh, you know, mainstream nightlife because, yeah, 20 years ago, we could say that techno was mainstream, but these days, you know, techno, it's not, it, it's, it is not underground, it's very mainstream. So um, the thing is that the, the new experimentation with music, with uh, raves and so on, uh, is being done informally by queer communities that are, you know, occupying other uh, uh, places in the city and uh, creating uh, parties with other kind of uh, organization uh, and care policies also. So this is uh, quite interesting and is, um, you know, a reindication of uh, nightlife for these communities, um, what is quite important. And okay, I will finish here and I'm sorry, probably you are hearing my kid that is sick at home. <laughs> And thank you for hearing me. <laughs>